Hey y'all, it's your girl Sonya, and welcome back to She Say, She Say Sports. Today I have with me Anchorman Wisdom Martin from Good Day DC. Wisdom, how are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing great, Sonya. How you? How you doing? I am doing well. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Could you oh, tell, no the listeners, tell the listeners a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, I'm from Mississippi. I went to D. Jackson State University, Mighty <laughs> <D>? Tigers. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> hail, hail to thee. Uh, I, I've worked all over the country. I've done sports. I've done news. I've been in. Uh, I work at CNN for a little while. I worked in California. I worked in Atlanta. Uh, well, CNN is in Atlanta, mm-hmm. Nashville, and I've been in D.C. for 18 years. Wow. That's yeah, I'm a. I'm an old man. <laughs> well, an look, old man. No, because if you're old, then that means I'm old. <laughs> Okay, I take so, I take it back then. <laughs> we're still we're still young right. and vibrant. <laughs> but yes. before we get started, you posted a message from your daughter a few weeks ago that just yes. melted my heart away. <laughs> and she what's her name? Her name is Nadira and she she's twelve years old. Nadirian, okay. Yes. She said, Dear Daddy, have an extraordinary day. I love you so much. And she then gave you the quote of the week, which is the scripture, First Chronicles twenty eight twenty. Yes. She told you not to be afraid. Thanks for dinner and enjoy your coffee. She and seems to be such a beautiful child, and she is a daddy's girl. Oh she my God. is. She's the youngest, uh, youngest of the three, and mm-hmm. she is uh, the sweetest and most sensitive. And she also is a reader. Like she has always been a reader. She goes to to the bas- The other two play basketball. My oldest daughter and my son play basketball so she has to go with us to the games okay and she takes a book with her to the games because she's not interested in watching them and she'll say this stuff is boring and she (laughs) will sit there she will sit there and read the entire time different books yes and and the people are like how do you get her to do that and i said that's that's god because she just likes to read she wow well and she writes me do you know she writes me a note almost every day I was about to ask you, does she leave you one often? So she does that every day. Almost every day. Sometimes she forgets, but most days she writes me a note, and I, she doesn't know this, but I'm collecting them, and I'm going to put them in a book. Oh, my God. I, I, keep, I keep every one of them. So, yeah. That is so sweet. Oh, my God. <laughs> now, don't ask me about the other two. Oh <laughs> don't ask me about the teenage girl. <laughs> that all is- I'll say, there's no notes left from that. <laughs> no, no notes from her. No. <laughs> well, I know I won't be interviewing the baby girl because she don't like sports. So, <laughs> well, she seems to be an amazing, thoughtful child. And she, you and her mom, is. y'all did a great job. Yes. Great child. <laughs> but I have a question. Yes. Could you explain how you got the name Wisdom? Okay. So. My father's name is Wisdom. He went to Jackson State as well. Oh, uh, let, okay. me, let me tell you the whole, because I did a story on this for Black History Month about Jackson mm-hmm. State uh, on our air, actually, that aired. Okay. Everybody in my family, this, this sounds crazy, went to Jackson State. My grandmother went to Jackson State when it was like one building. Um, my father went to Jackson State. His name is Wisdom, by the way, and his father's name is Wisdom. It came out of the wow. Bible, Book okay. of Proverbs. Mm-hmm. And um, my dad's brother went to Jackson State. My brother went to Jackson State. My mother wow. went to Jackson State. Her two <laughs> sisters went to Jackson State. My um, cousins, my dad's brother's children, all three of, three of them, four of them, went to Jackson State. It's, it's insane. It, so it you is come from insane. a long line of tigers. Yes, and then we should be going to school for free from here on out. Hello. That's all I'm saying. <laughs> but we, we've given them a lot of money, a lot so of money. your children continue the family tradition? Well, I think uh, my 16-year-old, my daughter, plays basketball, and she said the other day that she wants to go to Jackson State. Uh, so we'll, we'll see. That's what she awesome. says. That's what she said. So we'll see. Because her, her, um, her grandparents are still down there. My in-law still my – in-law, my father-in-law used to work at Jackson State. He, he retired. Uh-huh. McKinley Alexander in the school – in the um, economics. Okay. So, oh, no, I was in music, so no. I was yeah. In- no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't I take didn't. his class either. It's too much for me. I can, I can have it. <laughs> no. no. But, um, so, yeah, so she, she wants to go to the school there, I think, more so to be around them. And she's been to the campus. She loved the campus, the okay. new campus, because, you know, when we were there. <laughs> but, but with them, we have, yeah. I believe we had more fun 
even though, you know, the new campus has all the, you know, the Chick-fil-A and all this yeah. new stuff, the movie <laughs> theater, we, right. because we had to make our own fun, I, yeah. I actually like it like the way we had it. Yeah, it was, oh. it was ghetto. It was good time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, I know. I loved it. I had, I had a blast, and I was talking about it all the time. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was, it was amazing, and I wouldn't change it for the world. And, but she, when she goes down there now, she thinks it's always been like that with all the new stuff and the new shiny building. Oh, no. And I'm like, nope, it wasn't like that. I was in the same dorm that my dad lived in when I was there. Wow. And, I, and, then, and then I moved uptown and I went over to the lodge apartments where I was Hello. living in the highlight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, I, I used to be over there quite a bit. <laughs> I think all of us used to be over there. Everybody yes. was over at the lodge. Oh, my God. You, you, you went way back with that one. <laughs> A lot. Uh, <laughs> um, is your wife? Did she go to Jackson State? Her, she went to Jackson State, but she only went in the summers because she ended up going to Northwestern. Now she's from Jackson. She okay. went to Murrah, Murrah in Jackson, and mm-hmm. ended up at Northwestern to go to some kind of engineering thing on the Jake. I don't okay. know. I'll, and I give her a hard time about that. I was like, you had to, <laughs> you had to go to a crappy school. You should have gone to a real school. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> she went to Northwestern. I'm like, ah, oh, you were slumming it. You should have gone to Jackson. <laughs> so you were slumming, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. All Chicago, you know, all that, whatever. <laughs> that's right. Well, I actually, that's, I, want, I was a music major, and I wanted to actually, because Jackson State didn't have a voice in performance, I wanted to mm-hmm. go to Northwestern. For oh, you did? Perform- I wanted to for their uh, uh-huh. voice in performance um, degree, but I, I didn't go. I changed oh, okay. lanes. Yeah. So, yeah. Right. That is so cool. Yeah. Yeah, Look, so you made yeah. the you made the right choice. I did, I did. <laughs> so, back to your name. Um yes. you mentioned, yes. you know, in the Bible, God offered mm-hmm. Solomon whatever his heart desired and he yep. chose wisdom. Yeah. And the Webster Dictionary Webster Dictionary defines wisdom as the ability to discern inner qualities and relationships. Mm-hmm. My mother has always said, there's something in the name, and be careful what you name your children. <laughs> I've heard that. And, <laughs> right. So my, my youngest niece is named after me. I'm Sonia Annette. She's Sonia Maria. And mm-hmm. she's so much like me in so many ways. The way she loves music, she actually got her music scholarship at Jackson State 20 years from the date that I got mine. Oh, cool. She loves people, very mm-hmm. fun-loving. Right. But my question is, do you live up to your name? Are you oh. able to discern <laughs> inequalities in relationships? Oh, oh, I try. I try. <laughs> I do my I do my best. It's hard, as you know, out in the real world, it's hard. It's hard. Oh, yeah. It takes oh, you yeah. it takes you a while to figure out figure out uh, because like I said, I've been at Channel Five at, at Fox Five in D C and Fox mm-hmm. Five, not Fox News Channel. There's a difference. Yeah, there there's, is. There's a huge difference. Huge difference. I'm sure people can figure out what I'm talking about. Yes. Not, I don't work for the Trump network. I work for local D.C. news. Amen. So, yeah, Amen. So that's, that's where I work. But anyway, um, I've been here 18 years. And, you know, you have to, in the, in the real world, you have to navigate a lot of different stuff, figure, figure people out, figure where the power is, figure who you need to, um, to connect with figure out how people can help you. So there's a lot of that going on. And it takes a while to figure that out. Like when I started out back, I actually started out in Jackson at the ABC station in Jackson, WAPT. Mm-hmm. And that's where I kind of cut my teeth, learning how to do all these different things and figuring out, okay, this is the way the system works. And obviously it's not going to be fair. So I didn't expect right. that. So that's where the discernment comes in, navigating uh, the business world or, or the real world, whatever. And it doesn't matter what environment you're in because mm-hmm. if you're out there, unless you're working for yourself, you know, making your own money, um, and you work for someone else, you got to figure this stuff out. Okay. And, that's, and that's where, where the, the discernment and figuring things out comes in. Absolutely. <clears throat> Absolutely. So you mentioned, okay, so before, I, before, before we get to you working at WAPT, Mm-hmm. I, you know, I know you play basketball at JSU, but ended up breaking your hand. Oh, yeah. Did you have dreams of going pro or having a career in sports before that happened? You know what? I um, Initially, I did, like when I was in high school, I, did, I either wanted to do that. I had three things. Because my parents were teachers and my dad was a basketball coach, I, was gonna, okay. I wanted to be a teacher and a basketball coach, or – um, I, was, I wanted to be a journalist because I wanted to be that since I was a kid. 
Okay. So or, you've always, okay. Yeah, yeah. And or I wanted to play basketball because I love just love playing basketball. It didn't work out. I had too much going against me uh, when I when I got to college and started trying to play basketball. I got all kind of stories about that that whole thing um, <laughs> because I, when I first got to Jackson State, it was a diff, it, Andy Stoglin was, wasn't the coach and Lindsey Hunter wasn't there. He was at Alcorn. And I was actually supposed to go to Alcorn, but I was Jackson State born and bred, so I hated Alcorn. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I didn't want to, And my uncle was like, go down there and play ball and then transfer. And I was like, I don't want to go to no snake in Alcorn. I hate them. Well, I don't hate right. them, but you know what I mean. They're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, and that's exactly what Lindsey Hunter did. <laughs> he went to Alcorn, and then he transferred to Jackson State. They got the new coach and everything. But when I got there, it was chaos. Chaos. Mm. Uh, with that basketball team, with the losing, and the, it was some drinking going on and some other stuff going on. So they had to overhaul the whole thing, and it was, it was a mess. It, yeah. it was a straight mess. And then when I started partying in Jackson, as you know, I, when I came, you know I'm from the country. Mm-hmm. I'm from, I went to Carthage High School, which was about an hour away from Jackson, and it's in the country. And mm-hmm. I get to Jackson, and my graduating class in Carthage was, I think, about 105 people. Wow. And, and I had a couple of people that went to Jackson State from my, from my neighborhood, from my area, and they said, look, when you get down there, don't lose your mind because the ratio <laughs> of women to men yes, is like eight, eight to one, <laughs> and it's going to be, you will have opportunities. And I was like, what? <laughs> you like, so, excuse me? Yeah. So my, and my dad, because my dad was super smart, had a master's degree in math, which, wow. you know, but blew his mind that I couldn't figure out how to do math. But anyway, right. so he said, when you get to Jackson State, you are going to have plenty of time to do your work and do everything you want to do. You just got to focus and, and do what you need to do. I get to Jackson State, and the first, first night I was good. The second night, my friends <laughs> from Chicago and Milwaukee, my roommates from mm-hmm. Chicago and Milwaukee came in, and they were like, what are you doing in the bed? We got to go to the, to the women's dorm." We got to go to Alexander Hall and sit on the plaza because that's where everybody else is, and that and the rest is history. The rest is history. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> I actually said um, I used because you know we stayed on the we were always on the plaza in the yard. Yeah. I don't understand how I kept a, a decent GPA um, for yeah. a while, but yeah, um, I used to be like, well, my major is sewing and canoeing. I have a minor in canoeing because we just. I mean, we had so much fun on the plaza, and oh, it was, yes. it, it was it, amazing. It, it, it was, and I, and I it, <laughs> it took me a while to get my act together. <laughs> I'm glad uh, you did. <laughs> me too. <laughs> you 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 wisdom. <laughs> yes, it, it, it was slow wisdom. It took me a while, but because man, I boy, when I saw all those women from all over the place, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I went crazy. You you were you were amazed. Yeah, was, yes, I was amazed. I'm and then amazed. I, and that didn't even factor in because I was seventeen at the time. That didn't even factor in the, the Callaways and the Murrows of the world. There were, oh, wait a minute, <laughs> brother, and the Provines. Don't get and the Provines. Wait Callaway a minute, Murrow, Provine. <laughs> oh, I knew them all. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were you were, you were very happy. I see. <laughs> yes, yes, I was very oh, wow. happy. Very yeah, happy in Jackson. That was some good times, man. I yes. tell you. So, <laughs> tell me, you said you you always wanted to do journalism. What yes. sparked you as a your interest in journalism as a child? Well, you know, when I was a when I was a kid, um, back when before everybody had cable, there were like three channels: ABC, NBC, CBS. And after school, when I was a kid, because my mother was a teacher, she I would come home with her, her right. my brother and I. We would ride home with her from school, and when we would get home, she would turn the TV on while she was getting dinner ready, and we were getting ready to do homework and all this kind of stuff. And every day, I, don't, I can't remember the times, probably 5 o'clock or whatever time it was, the news would be on, and it right. would be World News. And I'll never forget, it was World News. I think it's called World News Now or World News Tonight or whatever it was at the time. And the people that were on there were um, Reynolds, Frank Reynolds, Peter Jennings, and a black man named Max Robinson. He's, he's deceased. He used to, he's actually from D.C. He's deceased now. But those are the three anchors. It was Peter Jennings was in London. Frank was in uh, New York, I think. And I think Max was in D.C. or Max was in Chicago. No, Max was in Chicago. So okay. anyway, 
I used to watch that, and I said, oh, that's, that's pretty uh, – that's interesting. And then on the weekends, they would have the uh, football games on NBC and CBS at the time. Right. And on CBS, it was – they had, some, you know, some white guys up there, but they had Jane Kennedy – Yep. And J- James Brown, who is from here, who I actually met, and I'm, I, I, it blew my mind that I got a chance to meet him. James Brown, who is the anchor of uh, CBS, the football show now, he was on there as a reporter, so I would watch him. And then on NBC, this is how long ago it was, Bryant Gumbel was doing the NFL on NBC back oh, then. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. So I used to watch these people, and this is why they say it's so, it's so important to see people who look like you. Yeah. doing the things that you want to do. And I know Brian Gumbo, you know, but he still was, <laughs> he still was had the same skin. He had the same skin color I had. Or, yeah, you know what I mean? And, man, so and he was talking say, about. Are you going to say Greg Gumbo was more than Brian? <laughs> I'll leave that up to interpretation. Yeah. But um, so I used to see him, and then I would watch James Brown and um, – and uh, Max Robinson and uh, Ed Bradley was around back then. I would watch these people, and I was like, oh, this is, uh, this is pretty cool. And I would just watch the news and watch, that, watch those football shows. And then the NBA on CBS back then, it was the St. James Brown was doing that too. Right. And, you know, the further I got along in it, then and later on it was Ahmad, Ahmad Rashad and uh, who else? Um, they would just have their Stuart Scott. Right. It's interesting. Oh, Stuart Scott from from the yeah, the late Stuart Scott from ESPN. It's interesting because Stuart Scott was in Raleigh, North Carolina. He went to the University of North Carolina. He was a Tar Heel. He was right. in North Carolina working at WRAL as a news reporter before he went to ESPN. Before he went to Orlando and then ESPN. By the time I was actually Stuart Scott's replacement because it took them so long to replace him from WRAL because they wouldn't let him do sports at WRAL. So he went to Orlando and then went to ESPN. So once he left, it took them forever to replace him, and I was his, his replacement at WRAL in Raleigh. Wow. But I was doing, I was doing news. But um, so seeing those people, um, that, that really motivated me to, to pursue this. I liked it. I knew what it was because my parents were teachers and educators, they said, okay, well, this is what this, this, this is. This is what it requires. This is what you need to learn how to do. And when you get to school, this is what you need to major in. And, and that's what I did. When I got to college, that, that's what happened. And, and the funny thing is, the way I got my – I tell this story all the time. The way I got my entry into the business my sophomore year, at the end of my sophomore year at Jackson State, was we were in the classroom, in uh, Mr. Crump's classroom, Actually, in the, uh, what do you call that big room in the uh, mass comm? Uh, whatever that room was. The big room. The, the big old room that's in the mass communication room I, in the building. I never had to go there. Yeah. So there was a big room in there that they used to have class. So Mr. Crump was a teacher. He was late to class one day. And we were sitting in the classroom. And Deanna Sheffield, I believe, is she your sorority sister? My sorority. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> My sorority. Yeah, because, we, because we came at, into Jackson State at the same time. She was in class, and Deanna was, you know, ahead of everybody else because she was so smart. She already had a job at Channel 16 in Jackson. Some kind of program, because she had great grades and was a great student, they, mm-hmm. they had a program where she was working at Channel 16 as a reporter trainee like two days out of the week. Wow. So she was actually reporting. I remember at Channel that. 16, yeah. So she comes that. into the classroom one day and says, hey, they need a, um, some, a, a production person to work at Channel 16. I don't know if they pay, but the news director said something to me about he was looking for a student that might want to do that job. So she asked one guy, it was three of us on the road. Deanna was in the middle. There was a guy on the right and I was on the left. When I walked in, she was telling the guy on the right this story about Channel 16 needs this, this, and that. I don't know if it pays. So the guy on the right says, but if they're not paying, I don't work. I don't work for the man for free. <laughs> He's not passionate. Yeah, he didn't. He didn't feel it. He wasn't feeling that. So I said, uh, "Yeah, uh, Deanna, what? Tell me about that again." And she gives me the spiel and says, "I don't know if they pay." And I was like, "What time do you want me to be there?" And she said, "I'm gonna go talk to him today. I'm going to work." And then, and then she gave me the date to come. And I went and I got the job. And the final point on that is that was right around the time where I I'd, uh, I had a cast on my hand because I had broken my hand. Mm-hmm. So 
So I had a, at this point, I had a temporary cast on my hand. I took that cast off to go to that interview to shake that man's hand. Wow. <laughs> That's how bad I wanted that job. Yeah, he shook my hand. Pain, I'm sure. I almost cried when he shook my hand because <laughs> it was so painful. Oh, but my I was, God. I was willing to, willing to do that to, to get that job. And she talked me up. So all I had to do was show up, and she was, he was like, oh, I understand you like sports, and I understand you like this and that, so I encourage you to do this and talk to this person and yada, yada, yada. And he hired me on the spot to do production, which was Amazing. basically running the teleprompter, uh, figured out how to run the camera and how to do the tape back then. It was tape, play tapes, you know, the whole nine yards. So right. I just learned everything. I talked to people about how to do sports. Eventually they let me, uh, probably about a year and a half later, Eventually, they let me cover Steve McNair. This is when he first started because they didn't think, mm-hmm. you know, it was all corn. It wasn't a big deal. Right. So I go down there and start covering Steve McNair, and Steve McNair starts blowing up. This is when all corn was better than Jackson State at the time because, because of Steve McNair. Right. So then they, they switched the assignment. <laughs> they, they sent me to Jackson State, and then they start going to all corn. So that's, Steve that's McNair. Messed up. <laughs> But that's, you know, that's, that's the way it was. I was at the bottom of the total pole. So, yeah, and you had to do what you had to do. So, right. so that's and how I know, got, got started in the business. You know, it's amazing. You know, uh, my soror, Deanna, and she's, mm-hmm. still, she's in Florida, right? Yes. R- okay. Working for Big Brothers, working for Big Brothers, Big Sisters. Okay, okay. So yeah. she's not, she's not yeah. um, um, doing journalism in the no. right now? She, okay. she, she, she got out. She had enough. Okay. <laughs> Understood. <laughs> Yeah, it's amazing how it's so important to have the right people in your life. It's yes. when it comes to your destiny. Mm-hmm. And, you know that guy that you know said if they're not paying, you know I don't want it. Yeah, but you did this because this was a passion of yours since you was a kid. Right, and you was like you know right now that that doesn't matter. That's not important. I need the experience. I need the exposure. Right, do what I need to do, and you know that's that's amazing how that ended up, you know, just lining up for you. Yeah. And it's amazing. And I tell a lot of people don't understand that sometimes you have to make a sacrifice. It might not be the money that you want. Right. And it might not be the position that you want at the time, but you have to, sometimes you have to make some kind of sacrifice so you can get in, into a position, as you just said, to, to meet some people to get into the spotlight or, or try to get into the spotlight to learn some things and to learn right. how to navigate. See, that's all, all those things are things that I was learning as I was coming up along the way. All the disappointments and all the, um, you know, not being able to do certain things. You're like, okay, well, what did I do wrong in that scenario, in that situation? What can I do better next time? Because the next time I get this opportunity, I need to go left instead of going right. Exactly. So, all those things are, are important, and it is important to, to be able to connect with people and have the right people in your life at the right time. That's true. Yeah. And, you know, so when you were at WAPD, WAPT, did you make a decision of what you wanted to do in media while there, or it still was not? <laughs> well, I always wanted to. I, initially, I wanted to do sports, but then I started doing, I started doing some news stuff, and the big news story, the biggest news story that I covered, uh, right before I left, was Megger Evers, uh, the trial of Byron Della Beckwith, the guy who shot Megger Evers. They oh, finally yeah. caught him after all those years. And that was a big, big show. They had everybody on that story because he was in court. Um, but I, I always... You doing that. Yeah. yeah. That was the biggest... I mean, yeah, that was, that was huge. Um, that was real huge, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I always knew I wanted to do this. But my thing was when I got to Channel 16... I wanted to have a job, and I wanted to have, have a, a number of skills so that I could work. So I, I said to myself, okay, I know I want to do either sports or news. I want to be in front of the camera. But what mm-hmm. I'm going I'm to do is position myself to where I will have a job just in case I don't get in front of the camera. If the, gotcha. cam, if the in front of the camera part doesn't work, I know how to edit. I know how to work this camera and go out and shoot stories. I right. know how to do that and back then. And like I said, it was, a, it was tape, tape production, which was putting the tape in the machine and all that kind of stuff. So I was learning all those things inside, and I would watch that. I didn't get a chance to produce at that time, but I was watching them, and I was saying, okay, I can do this job. If all that else failed, I can do this job, and I can go over here and do this, and I can do that, and I can apply for this. So when jobs would come open, I would just start applying. 
And if I didn't get that particular, like I said, I was prepared to do whatever it took to get to where I needed to be. Right. So, and, I, and, and again, I wasn't going to be unemployed because I, I wanted to work because I wanted mm-hmm. some money. So right. I had to learn whatever I needed to learn so that I could always be marketable and get a job. So that, that was what was my goal. But I always wanted to be in, in front of the camera and was trying to prepare myself to do that. That's cool. And I watched, so I watched a lot of, and not only that I practiced, because I stayed a lot of, towards the end of my um, time at Jackson State, I spent a lot of time not on the plaza because I spent plenty of time my first couple of years on the plaza. <laughs> right. But towards the end, that when it was time, you know, time to get serious and get out of there, I passed up on a lot of, you know, party. We were still, they're still partying, but I, had, I passed up on a lot of that because I wanted to go into the station and learn some new things, put together some tapes, you know, do some extra work, right. meet with some people. I, had, I actually gave people money, some of the directors some money, so they could stay a little longer to help me put together my tape on, on Fridays and Saturday nights, late, mm-hmm. like late, like 11 o'clock at night. Right. So, so I, was just, I was just motivated to, to keep going. And, and see how far it was going to take me because that's how that I wanted it just that, that bad. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, as you mentioned, after leaving JSU and WABT, you were a reporter in Fresno, Raleigh, mm-hmm. yep. CNN. However, yep. like you said, you've been with Good Day D.C. since, what, for 18 years now? Yes, and 18 years in D.C. It's funny. When I came to D.C., uh, I only planned to be here three years because it was so freaking expensive here. That's, this is back <laughs> yeah. before the market, the 2008 market correction. Um, it was so expensive here. And I was like, I didn't anticipate this. I thought I was coming up here and I was going to have a good time, but it's, it's a lot to, <laughs> yeah. to, to live up here. So I was out in the suburb, and the problem back then was the economics was, as we saw in the crash, what happened. Right. Say, for example, up here a house, if the market for the house was $400,000 up here, like a regular old house in a, in a good neighborhood, if it was right. $400 was the market value. People, and this was all over the country, but it was really bad here. People would pay $600,000 for the house and try to flip it in six months. Mm. For seven, you know, they would try to flip it for seven hundred in, in six months because the market was that, just that crazy at the time. Right. And it was working up until a point people would buy it for 400 and then they would sell it for 500 Then the next person would buy it, and then they would sell it for 600 Well, then, by 2008, people got stuck. So then you had people who paid, you know, $700,000 for a $600,000 house, and then the house was on, and then the market was only saying, oh, well, now the house is worth 550 but you paid right. 700 for it. So they were, you know, they created a crazy market. Once that market correction happened, it got a little better. And then you start figuring out, okay, I need to go a little bit further out of the suburbs so I can live, live, live a little bit better. Right. And I get, when I was initially here for the first couple of years, I covered breaking news, which was, you know, in D.C., murder, madness, and mayhem, mm-hmm. um, crime on the streets, you know, a lot of corruption um, with the city council, and then over in Prince George's County, which is the largest uh, or the most affluent black county in the country. Um, they had a lot of, there were a lot of issues over there with the police department and with the, the leadership over there. And, and it was all, there was all kind of stuff going on here. So there's plenty of news in this area. But the good thing is, the good thing about D.C., it's a political place. We know about all the politics and everything that goes on here. But on a local level, a local level, I got to tell you, the African American community here in Prince George's County, in Washington D.C., and in Montgomery County, and all the surrounding—they, when you when you are capable of doing your job and you show up on TV, they love you and they will support you. I got to tell you, they they supported me. They would, I mean, I would go into some some neighborhoods where I was a little nervous, and I was uh, with with some some white guys, and they were a little nervous, and I'm getting out of the car, and, and these people are walking up to me. They're like, "Hey, what's up? Hey, how you doing? I'm so good, you know, doing that." And I was right. like, oh, this is, you know, and they would, they would, and I'm not kidding, they would look out for me because that's, that's, that's how loyal, once they, once they liked you and once they trusted you and they found out I went to Jackson State to HBCU, oh, I was gold. Right. <laughs> I was so gold. You were good. <laughs> yeah. 
you know, and, and they just had to they just had to trust you and and feel feel like you weren't trying to do them in because sometimes you know the media does some some shabby work, right. and and they do some shabby jobs on some communities. And once they figure out, you know, that you're you're in their corner and you're not the one trying to do them in. I mean, they would call me and tell me about stuff. I would know stuff other people would know. Police officers on the streets would call me and tell me things, and then. Everybody's like, how did you know this? You just got here. You've only been here for four or five years. And I was like, oh, I'm lucky, I guess. So, <laughs> right. So, I mean, but this goes back to what you were saying about, you know, being able to connect with people. I mean, you know, having the right people in your life at the right time. Right. All those things are, are factors in the, into, into being successful at whatever it is that you're, you're, you're trying to do. I've had a, I've had a chance to meet so have a, I've had a lot of fun too because uh, it wasn't just all breaking news. Um, I've had a lot of, a chance to meet a lot a lot of people that I admired when I was growing up or when I was you know coming coming up along the way. So mm-hmm. that that part has been fun too, and I've been pleasantly surprised how nice most of them are. I said ninety percent right. of them ninety percent of them are nice. Yeah, <laughs> that's, and that's cool though because you know it's just like. You're meeting people like, oh my gosh, I've been, you know, yeah. a fan so long, and then right. you meet them and they're they're kind and yeah, that's, that's a that's a good feeling because you know, right, you know, it's a good feeling. So yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. Now, now you um you mentioned you covered some major stories. One of them mm-hmm. um being Hurricane Katrina in '05. Yes. What was the biggest story? I mean, was that the biggest story you had reported during your career at that time, and how did it affect you as a journalist? Well, that was because here, the thing about Katrina is it was, so, it was so massive for New Orleans in a negative way. Because right. here, you, here you have, we, we all know what New Orleans is. It's a, it's a, I mean, it's a festive city. It's a party city. Uh, uh, right. The Southern Charm, you know, you go down there, Bourbon Street and Canal Street, people partying, the you food. know, hurricanes, <laughs> drinking, you know, the whole nine yards. Yeah. Mardi Gras. So then you have this hurricane that comes through, or the, and the levees broke, and it, it pretty much wiped out. It didn't wipe out the city, but it shut the city down, and it did left all this damage. We fly down there into this, this American city, That's Amer- an American city, and the roads are empty. There's water in the middle of the interstate. You're driving down the road, and, and the road is blocked off because it's completely flooded. Then you turn over here, and then we got on a boat one time and with, with uh, some rescue people that were going around trying to get people out of houses, and dead bodies are floating in the water. This is Amer- an American city wow. Wow. where there were dead bodies floating in flooded water, bloated dead bodies. Dogs were, I mean, it was so sad. Dogs were hanging from, like, apartment buildings because the water was all the way up and people couldn't get to their animals. So the dogs were, you know, just up there, and they had starved. I mean, it was some of the saddest Horrible. stuff I had ever seen. Now, people were helping, so that, that was the good part. Right. But to see that festive American city in dire straits like that, from, the, from all that water and from the levees breaking, it, it was unbelievable. Those people in the, in the Superdome and all the chaos that was going on down there, and they were trying to get help. And it, it, it was unbelievable. We actually went down there for, I think we were down there for four or five days. We flew in. We had to get a rental car, but we had to fly into, I forget, where did we, Baton Rouge, and drive over. We had to stay in an RV because there were no hotels. Obviously, there were no hotels, like, within right. a 10-hour radius. You, know, you couldn't, not in Dallas, not in Jackson, nowhere, because everybody nowhere. was, yeah, it was all gone. So. That, that, to me, was the, the biggest story because of the, the impact that it had on New Orleans and, and the way that it, it wrecked, wrecked that city, mm-hmm. knowing, knowing what it was before you. Now, the other big story that I, that I covered, uh, well, and I covered that story here. Actually, it was two. Sean Taylor, the football player from the Washington Redskins, when he got oh, yeah. killed, yeah. That, was, that was unbelievable, that was too. Because he was a young man, he was an up and coming star. He was going to be a, he was on his way to the Hall of Fame by year, by year two. That's how good he was. He gets shot uh, while while the team was in Florida. He goes home to do something. He was injured, so he goes home instead of goes with the, going with the team. And he gets shot. So it comes on the radio that he gets shot, 
And I hear him talking about it, and I'm like, okay, he gets shot. What's the big deal? Then they start talking about it. It's uh, the femoral artery in his leg. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that sounds bad. And then the next thing you know, he's dead. And I'm like, yeah. what? So then we get on a plane, and we go down there. And we were down there for like four or five days. And that was, that was sad because, again, here you have this young guy, just three, three or four years in the league, he was a stud. He was a father. Yeah. And all of a sudden, his life is gone because somebody broke into his house and wanted to take his stuff. I mean, okay. it, was, it, was that, it was that simple. So he's gone. And it was, it was emotional because, again, a young guy, up and coming, minding his own business, is shot in the, in the leg, in, in the wrong spot in the leg, and, and he dies. So that one was heavy, too, and I, the Redskins have, have never recovered from that. Have never, well, they I were really already – they right. were, Yeah, they were – because he was the cornerstone. He was going to be the cornerstone yeah. for, on defense for a long time. And once they lost him, it kind of it, it went sideways. So, those are, so that was one. And then the, the other one, the last one I'll tell you about, was this um, – they had these serial bank robbers up here that were going around hmm. robbing banks with machine guns. It was a group what? of them. <laughs> yes, and they had hit like, and this is in D.C. and D.C. and Maryland area, all close together. So they were just going around robbing banks, like in the movies. Like a group of them would get in the van, put their mask on, have their AR-15s, and they'd go in there and rob the bank. Well, one day, we were getting ready to shoot a promo. I wasn't there yet. We were getting ready to shoot a promo. A mm-hmm. photographer was over there across the street from SunTrust Bank, not too far from the station. The bank robbers robbed the bank. He turns his camera on and gets them on video coming out of the bank with the AR-15s what? and the mask, like they jumping in. It is the craziest thing ever. Oh, my God. So he just he turns the camera around and gets them running out of there. The lady runs out of the bank. Oh, my gosh. They just, the bank robbers are in there. They got this. So at this point, one runs out with the AR-15 and the mask on. He's hiding behind the van. Looks just like a movie. Then another guy runs out. He jumps on the side of the van. Then another guy runs out with the AR. They all got on masks. They all got machine guns. They got the bags of money. They jump in the van. They speed across traffic, over, you know, going through traffic. I'm surprised they didn't hit anybody. And go down the hill. And the dye bag goes off. The dye pack goes off. So it's red smoke. So, and then they go down the hill. This is so huge because we're the only ones that have video now of, of the serial bank robbers. And they eventually caught them, but that, that was huge. Everybody was like, oh, my gosh, that's, it made, that made national news. That is crazy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. <laughs> some, of the, some of the wildest video I've ever seen. So I showed up on the scene and did the live shot for the day, and then somebody else stole my work, but we won't talk about that. You know what? I think, you know, and that's, uh-uh. <laughs> that's that bull crap. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Not cool at all. <laughs> You know, I, I want if you can if you can find that video, please send it to me. I want to okay. see that. That's All right. interesting. Wow. Yeah. Y'all, yeah. You're that, in the right place at the right time. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. And the guy was just just standing there, and that and, and it's funny because the photographer who shot that video, they had he had gotten in trouble for so many different things at work. You know, falling asleep on the job, not doing this, not doing that. <laughs> he had a meeting with, with management that day <laughs> wow. about his, his work production. Basically, he, he was getting in trouble that day. He had a meeting because he had gotten in trouble for something he had done that yeah, day. he got a raise that night. Yeah. Well, well, he was good for that moment. <laughs> oh. <laughs> they, just, they just postponed the meeting until later. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> just like he messed up on that one. That wasn't right, me. right, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> Tourism, it's a lot going on in our country right now. Mm-hmm. And as an anchorman, as a black man, yeah. why are you able to report the stories on racism and the killings of unarmed black men by cops without losing it on air? How? It, I got to tell you, it, it is hard. It is it's hard because it's, at some point, well, actually, it's not just at, at this point, but for a while, it's been like, okay, uh, when, is it, when, is it, when is this going to stop happening? Yeah. Enough is enough. Now we have this happening on video. You know, back in the day when this used to happen, there was no video. Nobody had phones. Right. So the law enforcement would just be like, oh, it didn't happen like that. So he did this or he did that. 
And then people would just blow it off. Well, we didn't blow it off, but other people would just blow it off and say, oh, well, that's just so-and-so was being a criminal. That's why he ended up like that. Right. And that's, and that's the mentality, even with video. That's yeah, with still video. the yeah. mentality that some people have to this day. They will sit there and watch the video, which is infuriating. You sit there and watch the video of George Floyd being murdered, by this police officer with his knee on his neck for over And his minutes. hands in his pocket. And his hands in his pocket. And the, the first thing that comes to, to some people, like, well, what did he do? But it doesn't matter. Because, and I try to, and I used to try to have these discussions. I'm like, the job of law enforcement, as we know, is not to execute people on the spot. That's right. That's not their job. So when they start executing black people on the spot, that's a problem. And why people don't understand that blows my mind. It blows my mind. And then I turn around, and then I watch how people, how officers treat white people. Yep. Completely different. We had a, right before George Floyd, we had people protesting about this, you know, pandemic and the lockdown and everything. They wanted to get out of the house. So they were mad. So they go down to, I believe it was, the Maryland, Maryland State Capitol, one of them, they went somewhere. So there's this group with these, these militia people with these AR-15s and their masks on. They go down to this Capitol, and the police, are, the state police are standing there. They're all in their face, and they're yelling at them, and they're cussing at them, and the police are just standing there. Amazing. No, they don't flinch. They don't do anything. They're not, they're not afraid. And these people got, have guns. It, it, it's unbelievable. And then... I also watch when they're able to detain white suspects without incident. They, they, the white suspects, you know, the last guy, I can't remember the last guy they arrested, but he had killed somebody. They were able to go in there and get him without incident. All these cops go in there, just get him, put him in cuffs, bring him out. The guy that shot the, the people at the church in, in, I believe it was South Carolina. Yeah, it took him to get a burger. Took him to, took him to Burger King. <clears throat> Yeah. Now, here these people are murdering people, and you're able to figure out how to detain them. But we get nonviolent offenses, and we end up dead. And the first response is, well, what did he do? I'm like, I, 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 I'm done trying to explain that. So that's why it, it is, it is it's so hard trying to, trying to um, read and, and present this stuff in an unbiased way. Because there's no, there's no justification for it, and there's no excuses, there's no explanation for it, and, and enough is enough. You're right. And, you know, I'm just nine months in doing this radio show, and sometimes mm-hmm. it's so hard to not vent and say what I really want to say. Yeah. And I know it's not professional, and I have to bite my tongue quite a bit. Yeah. So for a newbie in the media field like myself, what are some things I can do to keep it professional and report the story without being mm-hmm. too emotional? Well, just basically say, just do the facts, just present the facts as they are, um, and not as, you know, some politicians want to spin it or some people want to spin it, they, right. because the facts are the facts. The fact of the matter is uh, Derek Chauvin had his knee on his neck while that man was restrained, while George Floyd was restrained, and he had his knee on his neck for over eight minutes while he was saying, I can't breathe, and he died. Okay. Those are the facts. So, I mean, at that point, what else is there to say? So That's my thing has always been present, present the facts as they are and just mm-hmm. leave, it, and leave it there. Yeah. And if you, want to get, if, if you want to get into opinion after that, then, you know, that's, that's a matter of how you want to handle that. But I yeah. always, my, my objective and my thing has always been, well, I'm just going to give you the facts up front. Now, and if you want to ask me something else, or if you want to get into discussion about something else, then we can do that. But here's, here's what happened. I'm not talking about what did he do and the conjecture of his criminal record and all that kind of stuff and, and, and why, why um, rappers use the N-word uh, and they can get away with it. I'm not, no, we're not talking about that. Right. No, we're not switching yeah. it up. We're not talking about the, the, you know, Colin Kaepernick is kneeling, talking about police brutality and, uh, and racial inequality. But we're not talking about fighting, for, fighting a war for the flag because that's what they were fighting about. So don't try to right. twist the subject up. Just give me the information. But, and, because and here's, 
Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm no, sorry. no, no. Go ahead. No, no. Go ahead. I was that when you brought up Colin, just the fact, you know, first they were like, you know, that's wrong, you know, yeah. um, demeaning the flag. But then on, at the then now the protests are happening. They're like, why can't you peacefully protest? He was yeah. peacefully protesting. Exactly. And he like that then. Exactly. So now, that we have your attention. And I'm not just saying black people. It's white people yeah. out there doing it too. Right. So right. now that the world has your attention because had you just arrested those four cops, yeah. none of this would be going on. But right. it was meant to happen. It was meant right. to happen this way. And just like Floyd, um, George Floyd's daughter, Gigi, said, Daddy changed the world because yeah, he the did. whole world has got involved with this. And I've never seen this in my lifetime. Neither have I. Never seen this. Neither so, have I. It's, you know, it's just amazing what's going on and how I think COVID-19 probably had a lot to do with it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, put this on my, I put this on a post a couple of weeks ago because Tokyo was protesting like two Saturdays ago. Mm-hmm. And I was just thinking, and I was like, you know, and I wrote, you know, how some people have acne and they have to use, you know, acne medicine. And mm-hmm. when they use that medicine, the skin gets worse before it gets better. Right. That's because mm-hmm. the medicine is working. Right. I said the medicine is working now. Yes. The prayers, the protesting, right. the, you know, standing up for what is right, the mm-hmm. medicine is working now. And it's right. really ugly. It's ugly yeah. right now. Yeah. It's ugly. That's, but you're but right. I know it's going to, it's going to, something is going to happen um, to make everything, you know, because this, this has to stop. It has yeah. to stop, period. It absolutely does. And what I like to see is, is what you just talked about is how the entire world is behind this. And mm-hmm. the young people, the young people are gal- galvanized. I, and the white people are marching in the street, people all over the world. My, my 16-year-old daughter, I, you know, you have to talk to your kids about this stuff because you, can't, you cannot ignore it because you can't they, ignore have it. To, they have to be ready to go out. And, and our nieces, nephews, cousins, they have to be ready to go out in these streets and deal with these police officers. And right. you cannot ignore the fact of what they do and how they behave. So my 16-year-old daughter comes to me and she says, I want to go protest. And we had, we had talked, this is initial, the initial protest in the, here in D.C., where mm-hmm. it, was a little, it was a little chaotic down there, and we're still at that point dealing with COVID-19. I'm like, well, we're not going to D.C. because that could get, that could get ugly real quick. And it, and it right. did. It did. But, and, and I'm glad that they, I'm still glad that they protest. Now, I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, I'm not taking you down there, putting you in that situation yeah, at absolutely. this point in your life. So absolutely. what we can do is when they have protests out here in our area, we can go, we can go then. She wanted to protest so bad, and now she's like, I want, I want to get involved in politics because wow. I want to make a change. And here she is 16. I love it. So, yeah, so we went to a protest this past weekend in Clarksburg where it was a bunch of at a high school. It's Clarksburg High School. Um, a bunch of students. Parents, and and this is a very diverse community as well. We got, you know, African, black, white, Latino, uh, Indian, Middle Eastern, Asian. This is a a diverse community out out here in in this area. And all of these people went to the school. We went over there, and and we marched down the street, and it was the Black Lives Matter movement. It was led by the students. So, So it was great. So I love the fact that these young people are getting involved. And as you said, the, this is the treatment that, that we needed for this acne that is racism <laughs> in this country. Because okay. it needs yeah. it needs it, we gotta we gotta do at least handle this part of it because this is this is just the tip of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. But at least we, we need to handle this part. Police reform, all of this stuff needs to take place. Absolutely. And you know, another thing that I'm sure you've heard or seen the stories regarding because of what's going on with the, um, George Floyd and the um, Breonna Taylor, mm-hmm. Amon, uh, every all of them, Tamir yeah. Rice, Trevon, I'm, I'm Trevon sure Martin, yeah, yeah, I've seen the stories regarding should black athletes leave D1 mm-hmm. power schools and attend HBCUs. With you being a former basketball player at Jackson mm-hmm. State, what are your thoughts on black athletes attending HBCUs versus PWIs? Well, I, here's my thing. All right, they, if you're good enough, they'll find you. We know right. we know that. If you're, so it doesn't. To me, it doesn't really. You know, it, it kind of matters where you go to school if you're trying to get to the NBA, kind of, sorta. 
Well, they found they found Steve McNair. They, they found, found Steve McNair. They, they found Walter Payton. They found Lindsey Hunter. Yep. They found, so uh, they found Eric Dampier. You know, and, yeah, Eric Dampier. Yeah, well, Steph Mississippi Curry State. went I'm to Davidson. State, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but but Steph Curry went to David. David is not a powerhouse basketball school. Steph Curry went there. I mean, so they will, they'll find you, right? And in the old days, when when we couldn't get into to the regular schools, we had a lot of top notch basketball players and athletes, for that matter, going to our HBCUs. Here's the right. problem. Here's the problem. Now, it sounds good in theory to say, okay, our top top black athletes go to. Our, we need to start going back to our HBCUs. That sounds good in theory, but you and I both know that these majority white schools, and I'm just going to call it like this, they pay. They break the rules. That's right. They pay. They pay players. So when you start talking about a top-notch athlete, I mean, look at how many times uh, University of Mississippi has been put on probation and they get busted for paying players, and they don't don't even win. Yeah. But they get get top-notch recruits to come there, and I'm trying to figure out why on earth would, would you go to that school you're not winning, so I don't understand why they, so they get paid. Right. So when there's money on the table and there's other friends' benefits, because I've seen, I've had friends that have gone to these schools, and I've been with them when they were getting recruited, and I know what goes on. The money is exchanges hands, the uh, benefits, they'll go over to this car dealership and they'll give you a car. Um, you know, go over here and talk to these girls, and they'll do whatever you want them to do. All that stuff goes on. Mm-hmm. So... It's hard if you're a top-notch athlete, you go to, you know, school X, which is a predominantly white school, and they're giving you money, they're giving you girls, and they're telling you, here's a car over here, you just use this car for whenever you need it, and if you're big enough, go buy your mama a house or put her in an apartment close to you. You know, they do all that kind of stuff That's because true. they can. Right. You're not get, unfortunately, you're not getting at an HBCU. So you go up to the HBCU and they'll say, okay, well, you go, you're still going to get to the NBA and we're going to do the best we can. <laughs> but you're going to have uh, but, to struggle a little bit. <laughs> but you're going to struggle. You're not going to be on TV. You're not going to get, you're going to have to get your own girls. You're going to have to get your own car. And then this player is going to be like, uh, I'm going to go back over here. Uh, that's, the, that's the reality of the situation. That, and that's why we, can know, we have a hard time getting top notch. Or even at this point, we don't. We have a hard time. HBCUs have a hard time getting top notch and second tier and third tier players because a lot of players would rather go sit on the bench at a, at a predominantly white school than to start at an HBCU because of the wow. benefits. Wow. Because of the benefit, they, they're still getting money. They're still getting kickbacks, and they're still getting the girls, and and still getting you know treated like royalty because they're on TV and all the fancy stuff and things that they get. So. Well, HBCUs, HBCUs are, you know, we're on TV now. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's ESPN, you, and, you know. Right. It's, but we're, yeah. we're, we are on TV now. Yeah, so. yeah. Yep. But, like I said, it's hard to compete with that checkbook. Yeah, you when, right. When those, when those guys from those car dealerships are saying, hey, um, you want a you wanna Corvette? Wow. I'm going to put it in, uh, put it in your uncle's name. So, here you go. Yeah, oh, yeah, you're right. I mean, it's, yeah, it's it's tough, but because we're talking about because we're we're talking about seventeen and eighteen year old old people here, yeah. and a lot of times, a lot of times, and and, and again, keeping it real, they're, they're getting taken advantage of because a lot in in some scenarios, their background because they come from backgrounds, and I know a lot of these a lot of these players come from backgrounds where they simply do not understand what's about to happen to them, right? Where they're getting used. You know, you come over here to my school, we're going to tra- take care of you, we're going to do this and do that, and the moment that you can't play or you get hurt, uh, you need to transfer because we need your scholarship. Or you go ahead and go to the pros, you make a lot of money, and then now you're, you're you know, connected to them. So now these people are like, oh, remember when we gave you that Corvette? Oh, well, we need you to – not only do you need to pay us back, but, you know, we're your boys and we're this and that. Nah, nah, nah. Okay, all right, well. The, and then the athlete who was 17 and 18 at the time <clears> – <throat> Well, that, that banker or that car dealer guy who was from the school that I went to, he took care of me and my mother and my father or my whoever when I was 17 and I didn't have nothing. So now I'm indebted to him for the yep. rest of my life. For the rest of so my I'm going to so I'm going to go out of my way with, with my money and support whatever he wants me to do. 
So that's Maybe. that's that's how that works sometimes. And when they run yeah. out of money, it, 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 it's it's game over. Game over. Yeah. And I mean, literally and fig- figuratively. Yeah. Figuratively. That's true. That's true. Yeah. So, well, I, I don't know. I'm I'm just I've seen a few of them. You know, like posting saying they're gonna um, switch over to HBCUs. So we'll yeah. see. I, mean, I know everybody's emotional right now. Right. But we will see. I, I think. Yeah. Um, some change is going to come in that area as well. Yeah. We, just, we as HBUs, we just got to be ready for it. So. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Yeah. I hope so. Wisdom, this was so fun. Thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, anytime. Anytime. <laughs> you know how we do it at Jackson State. Anytime. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Are you, uh, well, probably not this year, but um, homecoming. You coming home for homecoming soon when we have pro- one? Pro- well, whenever we can get back, get back on <laughs> yeah, planes and get around crowds again, I probably – I probably will. Yeah, you got to come. You yeah. definitely come so you can, um, you know, it's those four days. They, yeah. I, get, I get like eight hours of sleep from Thursday to Sunday. <laughs> yeah, I <laughs> know. So, I was thinking about that in the, mid, in the middle of this pandemic. I was like, man, I sure would like to get back down to homecoming this year. I just yeah. don't know if it's going to happen. Yeah, I don't know either. So we, we yeah. just, I, you know, we got to be careful. But when, when we're clear, yeah. we got to get home. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. yeah. With, Absolutely. Um, tell the listeners how they can follow you on social media. Okay. So on Instagram is Wisdom Martin TV, and with a bunch of E's because uh, the people made a mistake. So with T V E E E or something like that. That's on, on Instagram. Facebook is just uh, Wisdom Martin. And Twitter is at Wisdom Fox 5. Wisdom Fox 5. That's Wisdom on Twitter. Fox 5. Okay. Yeah, that's on Twitter. So, yeah. And- you can follow me at She Says She Says Sports on Facebook and She Says She Says Sports 23 on IG. Gotcha. Well, yep. that's gotcha. our show for today. Until next time, this is Sonya with She Says She Says Sports, and I'll see you on the radio. <laughs> <laughs>